Praise the Lord. I'm hoping that we are live. Amen. Amen. I am so grateful that I take heed to the weather outside. It seems as if that every time there's snow, I seem to be right here on Facebook Live. Um, I saw somebody earlier talking about how there is a, uh, a desire to bring people to church. And it was funny. It showed a man in a ditch. Both sides were walls of snow. And the guy's digging and saying, you know, how, you know, it's important for those to still come to church. But I come to the realization that in this day and age, we have options. We have alternatives. And this is one of them. So I'm grateful. I'm thankful that everyone is here tuning in. I love you guys. May God continue to bless you abundantly as we get into the word today. I want to just dive right in. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I do want to talk about. But before I go in, let me just let the church know, Flow Kingdom Ministries. Um, we will be uh, starting a series next week, next Thursday. And in that series, we're going to find, um, we're going to get into all of the kings of Israel, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And we're going to find that there are a lot of things that they did that pertain to us today. We go through stuff because we don't know what, what stuff we, they went through in the past. And I think sometimes all we need to do is read somebody else's history, somebody else's issue, go through what, see what they went through so we don't go through it as well. But again, I want to welcome everyone. I'm kind of stalling a little bit to see if uh, more people would come on. I know I see a ton of people coming on now. That's awesome. We uh, want to make today just as powerful as if we were at church. Uh, we want to make it so that you leave with information or you receive information that transforms your life. Um, as we get into the uh, study for today, just want to give you a quick heads up. Uh, there are several things happening right now, new things going on in the flow. We have right now a new place. Uh, glory to God. God has blessed us. And it's so interesting how things happen. We didn't seek it. We didn't try to um, obtain it. It came to us. And that's the best way to be able to receive something from God. When you're not breaking down doors to receive your blessing. When the doors are open for you. That's the best way to receive that which God has for you. And that's the best way to know that it's God. You don't have to open the doors. He opens them. And so one phone call led to another thing, and here we are. We're located right now at 1015 Gun Hill Road, and we're trying to make sure that all who knew where we were before, which was 921 East Trema, know that we have transitioned. And um, it is a bigger place. Uh, the place we were in, we outgrew. Glory to God. Now we are trying to make sure we can say the same thing in this place. Uh, we believe that God has set an assignment, and that assignment is clear. We all want to be a part of the expansion of God's kingdom. And let me make this clear. We're not here to increase or grow the flow. We're here to increase and grow the kingdom. All those who are listening right now, we want you to know that this is not about my land and my flow. It has nothing to do with that. Yes, the flow is the venue in which God has placed us in. We go and we expand his kingdom by way of the flow. But it's not. we're not the all in all. We're not the last Coca-Cola in the desert. There are many men and women of God who are doing the same thing. They're out there and they're doing what God has called them to do. And what's awesome is that they're specialists. One of the things I've learned in, in the friendships that I've built with a lot of men and women of God is that I don't know what they know, and I'm okay with that. And, you know, I think it's mutual. Those who are mature enough understand this truth. And whenever someone comes to me on something that I don't know, I don't try to play it off like I do know. You know, I make it clear, I don't know, but I know someone who does. And God starts building teams, and these teams get stronger. And certain individuals become part of your life, and you turn to them because they're a part of the expansion of God's kingdom. That's what it's all about expanding the kingdom of God and so again we are the flow we are the flow but the flow is a part of a greater flow and so many rivers lead to the same place or should I say the same place causes many rivers so I thank you again for joining 
Um, I give you um, the blessings of the house. I know that God is so in the mix. It took snow again to get me back on Facebook Live. This is my second time on Facebook Live in this manner. Um, and I'm hoping that I would be a blessing to many. Um, I know that so many people have different ways of receiving and processing. And I hope that this way does enter into homes, many homes that normally I would not be able to enter into. But simultaneously, um, I pray that again, the word today would truly transform your lives. I was so interested in being able to express how important it is to look at the things of the past and look at scenarios of the past and apply it today and see how we can either avoid a bad situation or move stronger into a good situation. Um, for those who know how I operate, I try to preach, teach. Today I'm going to try to stay focused on teaching, especially the fact that I'm restricted to this space here. <laughs> I, I'm trying to contain myself as, as many know that I am very animated. But I'm going to try to contain myself and really get into the word and pray that everyone, everyone receives today. Um, we don't allow a Thursday night to be uh, shut down. We want to make sure that we continue doing God's work. So let's open up in prayer. We're going to pray and pray that God anoints our ears and anoints our hearts and our minds to be able to receive that which God intends for us to receive. So I'm going to ask that everybody on the other side of this camera would actually take a moment and pray with me. Pray with me, not just for me, but with me as we pray together. All right, Father, we bless you. We thank you for this moment you've granted us to be able to receive a message clearly from you. Lord, today's message is who are you hearing from and who can rebuke you? Lord, I, I want to make sure that this message is clear for those who are being taught, who are being rebuked and being discipled, that they would know that not every voice is assigned to their ears. Not every voice is assigned to speak into their hearts. And Lord, I pray that what you give today, we can embrace it as your truth, not just a truth, but the truth, Lord, because a truth is a perspective or a part of the truth but we want to be able to receive your truth tonight Lord in Jesus mighty name we pray we give you all the glory and all the honor and the people of God say amen I can hear all of you say amen can y'all write on there amen real fast that way I can kind of relate with the uh, this um, Facebook live scenario so we're in 2nd Samuel chapter 12 in 2 Samuel chapter 12, we're going to touch on the rebuke of David. See, David was rebuked several times, and, and there's two particular times that I want to touch on. Today's uh, title is, Who Can Rebuke You? Who is allowed to rebuke you? Who is allowed to disciple or discipline you? Not everyone with a story or having the same story is able or should be in your ear telling you what's right and what's wrong. Let me just explain that a little further. I know that sometimes we want to be obedient to the higher authority. And of course, the word is clear in Romans 13. We should follow those who are in authority. But it is so true that many people have tried so hard to express their authority that they go beyond the lines. And it's important that we know who should we be listening to, who can speak into our lives, who can rebuke us, even if it's the same effect of someone who is not allowed. There are those who are assigned to us, and that assignment grants them the ability to speak a rebuke or rebuke when, when needed to be rebuked. So I'm going to go into 2 Samuel 12, and I like this style of rebuke. Um, there was a certain prophet by the name of Nathan, and in this story, we find that this prophet uses a strategy that I believe is the best strategy of rebuke. And the best strategy of rebuke is not being loud and being condescending or condemning. The best style of rebuke is getting the person to look in the mirror. The best style of rebuke is getting a person to repeat that which is there that they believe is wrong. Because David, 
And, and, that, and he's not the only one. Many people in their attempt to be uh, uh, authoritative, in their attempt to seem great and powerful, they tend to forget what they do wrong. And so it's always important to have someone in our lives who can do what Nathan did. Nathan does an interesting thing. And let's read so that way we can all be on the same page. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. So the Lord sent Nathan, the prophet, to tell David this story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day a, great, a guest arrived at the home of the rich man, but instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. The Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword. He tells him this, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says, because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man, and little did he know who that other man would be. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of all Israel. I'm sure David wished he was living in the time of grace. But this statement was given to him because he did something that was wrong. And sometimes in the wrongdoing, you tend to forget that you're doing something wrong until you're reminded of it. Now, does the way uh, Nathan projected himself in trying to make sure that this correction was not one of disrespect. He gave him a story. He told him the story and he said, well, let's see what your reaction is. If your reaction is going to be that of disdain and, and that of being disgusted of what took place, then now I can connect one with the other. Again, we as leaders and not just leaders, but everyone, we tend to forget. We forget what we've done and the things that we potentially can do. And so we live a lifestyle trying to tell, make people think that we're so holy, but yet there is no one to correct us. And in that lack of correction, you continue doing that. I can only imagine how David would have continued being or moving in that life of, of not even of neglecting what he had done. I can imagine him continuing that if Nathan would not have stepped in the picture. I can, I can imagine that he would have still kept doing the wrong thing. And the wrong thing was what he had as a standard. Think about this. He didn't think it was wrong until it was presented. Or if he thought it was wrong, he forgot that how wrong it was. Nathan comes along, tells him a story about the same situation, but a different version of the situation. He comes out and he says, let's take him out. That individual needs to be taken out. That individual needs to be punished. And that same word that he said came around and slapped him in the face. What is it that you want somebody to go through? 
Have you out of your mouth decided that you wanted someone to suffer based on something that you've done? Have you ever stopped and said, well, wait a second, does this person really deserve to be punished? And if they do deserve to be punished, do I also deserve to be punished? Shouldn't I go through the same thing? And should I be reminded? Do we all need a Nathan in our lives to remind us of that? It's interesting that in that process, we can say that remorse kicked in. David was remorseful and his remorse, I believe, led into repentance. His approach was that of one who recognized he did wrong. And what's awesome is that he doesn't say he sinned against those he sinned against. Look what he says. Verse 13. Then David convinced, confessed to Nathan. Then David confessed to Nathan. I have sinned against the Lord. He didn't say I messed up and I killed XYZ person. I, I, I messed up because I committed adultery with XYZ person. No, he said I sinned against the Lord. He realized that what he did because Nathan reminded him, reminded him of how special he was in the eyes of God. And maybe that's, that may need to be an approach that we have with people when we're correcting them. Let's remind them of how much God really loves them and how God wants them to get right versus how bad they are. I think some people really know how bad they are and they just may need somebody to lead them into correction. Showing them that in their correction, they being corrected is based on them visualizing what, what was done. Get them to see by way of a story or somebody else's story how bad they really are and how good they can actually be. Now, how bad they really are will be their own self-reflection. They're looking in the mirror. You presented the mirror. There's a difference between presenting a mirror and telling someone and condemning them and judging them to the point of destruction where you've destroyed them. You walk away satisfied because you made them feel bad or you made them reflect. I grew up in that environment. I grew up in an environment where in church you were condemned. It was condemnation and, and it was to the umph degree. Now, is that a good thing? Is that a good approach? Well, for some people, they say it's necessary to scare them. Into, into loving the Lord, I stick to what I believe. And what I believe is that God's love is greater than any fear. And his love, if you present it right, like the way Nathan did, Nathan presented the love of God. He actually says here, you know, how God blessed him. And he even said how much God wanted to bless him even more so. But he sinned against him. Now there is a punishment here. And here's the punishment. Now, this is why it's important. Today's title has everything to do with who is correcting you. Is the correction coming out of a pure heart or is the correction coming out of somebody who really wants to harm you along the way? This correction was authorized by God. Therefore, Nathan moved in a way that would be of God. He spoke accordingly to what God wanted to, to the heart of David. And David's response was, I have sinned against the Lord. Now, the response of Nathan was interesting. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you. You are forgiven, David. Even, even without asking for forgiveness, the Lord has already forgiven you. And you won't die for this sin. Meaning that the normal way it would have been is that sin would have been to his death. Whatever he did wrong would have been towards him. But he comes out and he says, nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord, by doing this, your child will die. What we didn't realize is that there is a connection there with not what he did, but what he did that led to his child paying the consequence. His child was unborn was just born as a matter of fact and you know when we see that there's a connection to our children and what we do now we got to think twice about what we do it's not just oh look what's going to happen to me it's look what's going to happen to my family what look what's going to happen to those who are connected to me my consequence is not just my consequence my consequence leads up many others that are connected to me and in this case, you found that what he did wrong led him to a place of 
having to reflect on himself. The word of God is clear. Let's not try to find more than what is. Let's always look at the essence. What is the essence of the story? The essence is David sinned. He forgot about his sin. He was reminded by Nathan of his sin. And in that reminder, he was given a second opportunity. But that which he threw out had to go somewhere. That which he did negatively had to go somewhere. His harm was so bad that that needed to end up somewhere. And where did it end up? It end up, ended up with his son. After Nathan returned to his home, the Lord sent a deadly illness to the child of David and Uriah's wife. David begged God to spare the child, and I can imagine him crying. He went without food, and he lay all night on the bare ground. The elders of his household pleaded with him to get up and eat with them, but he refused. In other words, he prayed and he fasted. He fasted and he prayed. But in that praying and fasting, he did not understand that what God spoke was that a, a word of the pen, not a word of the pencil. What do I mean? When God told Nathan to speak that word to him, that word was written in pen. It could not be erased. It was going to happen. And what's interesting is that what I'm going to share with you tonight, there is a combination of what happened here and what happens in the future with someone who rebuked David but was unauthorized. David was the king. David had authority. David was allowed to do certain things, but there were things that could not escape God. And so Nathan was given authorization for his ears. But then later on, we run into another story within the same frame, same person, different person rebuking. And in that story, the rebuking is unauthorized. And there's something that takes place when the rebuke is unauthorized. Now, there is not a feel of, wow, I've been told something and it hurts me. I'm now mad at the person. If you think about it, David didn't take revenge on Nathan for what Nathan said. David didn't say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and take uh, uh, Nathan out. I'm going to plan to take him out in the future. He didn't say that because he knew that Nathan was assigned to rebuke him. The rebuke was necessary because, again, we forget and we need to be reminded. Nathan was, one, was a man of God who was assigned a task, did what he was supposed to do, didn't go beyond that, didn't say anything beyond that, but spoke a word and then moved on. That's what a true prophet of God does. Doesn't add more. Doesn't add to sound better. Doesn't make it seem as if, oh, I got a little bit more. When you're a prophet, you give that word, you speak that word, and you move on. And you always understand that the word, ultimately, especially the New Testament prophets, your word has to be of edification. You have to be ready to edify the person you're prophesying to. That prophecy at the end of the day is supposed to bring that person to an awareness of self and move into correction. And of course, with correction comes growth. With growth comes character buildup. And that character buildup is required in the body of Christ. When David saw that the uh, men around him were whispering, he realized what had happened. And he asked the question, is the child dead? Yes, the child is dead. But look what David does. David, he gets up from the ground, he washed himself, put on lotion, and changed his clothes. He went to the tabernacle and he worshipped the Lord. After that, he returned to the palace and was served food and ate. He did what he did because of who gave him the message. How he reacted even afterwards was based on the fact that he knew it came from God. His question, is the child dead? They said yes. He knew what was going to happen. But he wanted to let God know, I know what's going to take place, but I'm still doing this anyway as a sacrifice to you. Today, today it's important for us to not do it the Old Testament way. We have the cross to turn to. We have the resurrection power of Jesus Christ to turn to. We understand that change requires a, a, a change of mind or a, cha a paradigm shift of mind where it gets you to a place of reflecting on self. So now let's go to the other rebuker. 
we spoke about Nathan. Nathan rebuked. Nathan rebuked. Authorized. His rebuke was an authorized rebuke. So now let's talk about that which is unauthorized. Follow me to 2 Samuel. Let's go to chapter 19. Now I'm going to give you a little heads up on what took place. And then I'm going to talk about, I'm going to go right into chapter 19. It is obvious that the word given by Nathan about the sword never leaving the house of, house of David was clear. The sword never left his house. David was not a good father. The paternal was not really his, his forte. He wasn't strong in that area. So bad was he as a father that he ends up doing the things that fathers, uh, should, fathers shouldn't do. He does the opposite. For example, if you know that your daughter was violated, then guess what? If your daughter is violated, then you do something about it. But then here's the, here's the bad part. If your daughter is now violated by your son, then you got to take care of that as well. And then taking it a step further, now your son, listen how bad things were in the house of David. Your son who raped your daughter, who are brother and sister, your other, the other brother comes and kills that brother. Now what? How do you fix such a debacle of that caliber? How do you take care of such a huge dilemma in the household? Well, it was clear that the, the sword remained in his house, but that didn't allow that God would still not, uh, still wouldn't allow certain people to come at him. In other words, God shielded him in the midst of his flaws. Everyone knows and have heard, has heard, or those who have not heard, of Absalom. Absalom was one of the sons of David. Absalom was actually the one who actually rose up uh, against his father. And it's sad because in that rising up, as some would say, well, it seemed a little justified because of what he did not do. Absalom was the one who killed his father. I mean, killed his brother. He killed his brother and got, was neglected by his father. Absalom was the one who, who uh, uh, took upon himself to, to now be in opposition of his father. And if you remember the prophetic word given by Nathan, here's the prophetic word so you understand what's going on. It's interesting. Nathan told him clearly about how he tells him just like this. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will cause your own household to rebel against you. Listen to this. I will give your wives to another man. You know who that other man was? That other man was none other than his son, Absalom. Absalom publicly disgraced David by sleeping with all of his concubine. See, everything that Nathan said came to pass. But even in that, David tried to preserve his fatherhood. He tried to preserve the area of being a father by trying to keep Absalom alive because those around David, those who were in authority, authority, those who were generals around him, one particular general named Joab, wanted, made it clear that he wanted Absalom out of the picture. Now, what I'm going to read now is going to show you two different scenarios that seemingly look the same. You have... Nathan telling David that his son is going to die. Nathan tells him that. David tries to fast, tries to pray to make sure that that does not happen, but it happens anyway. Then you have a future event, another rebuke. Nathan's rebuke was authorized. Joab rebukes David, but this one was unauthorized. Same result. Difference here is that the son was killed first. One was to let him know that the son will, son will die. The other one was to let him, was, was uh, an unauthorized attempt or an unauthorized uh, moment of killing his son Absalom. So let's read chapter 19 of 2 Samuel. Word soon reached Joab that the king was weeping and mourning for Absalom. 
as all the people heard of the king's deep grief for his son, the joy of that day's victory was turned into deep sadness. They crept back into the town that day as though they were ashamed and had deserted in, in battle. The king covered his face with his hands and kept on crying, Oh, my son, Absalom. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Then Joab, unauthorized, went to the king's room and said to him, We saved your life today and the lives of your sons, your daughters, and your wives and concubines. Yet you act like this, making us feel ashamed of ourselves. You seem to love those who hate you and hate those who love you. You have made it clear today that your commanders and troops mean nothing to you. It seems that if Absalom had lived and all of us had died, you would be pleased. Now go out of here, go out there and congratulate your troops. For I swear by the Lord that if you don't go out, not a single one of them will remain here tonight then you'll be worse off than ever before. He rebuked them. Joab took the position of authority over one he wasn't authorized to take position over. Joab was is a representation of those who have respect or loyalty to the crown, but did not honor the crown. He had no honor for David. He was loyal to the seat. He was loyal to the throne, not loyal to the person, or not no honor to the person. And so we find that both rebukes, or both, they all both have the death of a son. Death of the son who was born, and death of Absalom. One was authorized, and one was not authorized. One was given the, the, uh, the, 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 the word to speak into the life of David, and the other one wasn't. Now, what is the end result of that? Real simple. If the word of God is given to you by someone who is authorized to give it to you, you don't feel revenge in your heart later on to take them out. Because you know that that word came from God. If it wasn't by the man of God, like Joab, who spoke to him in a way that was unauthorized, now David felt anger, felt, he felt he needed to take him out. Later on we find out that that's one of the instructions he gives to his son Solomon. He says, you know, I'm not going to do it, but make sure you do it. Make sure you take him out. Because what he did that day was he blemished the crown and the person who wore the crown. He came against and he was unauthorized and there are so many, so many people around that are giving words and these words that are, they're giving are unauthorized. They're saying things based on what they think they know, not what they really know. And they speak from a place of anger and they speak from a place of hate. You want to distinguish someone who really is a man of God and listen to the tone of their voice and listen to where it's coming from. Listen to how they speak in love versus hate and anger. Look at where they, they, their purpose is. The purpose was to not remove David from his position, but rather bring him back to position. Nathan wanted to make sure that he was no longer in that, pay, that place of darkness, that he was no longer in that place of ambiguity. He wanted to make sure that, that David rose up to his position as king and that that blemish would not be there anymore. Why? Because as long as that room exists in David's heart, he would continue to think that that's the standard. And today in the United States, we have a major problem. The problem is that there are standards that are not being looked at by the word, by way of the word. And something as foolish as David looking at Bathsheba and desiring her, sleeping with her, and then killing her husband. There are standards right now that people have that lead to that. They believe that it's okay to be a certain way and act a certain way. And I'm like, Lord, why have we gotten to that place? Have we gotten to a place where we're not looking to the standards that God has established? Have we gotten to a place where we are rejecting the voices of the Nathans and listening to the voices of the Joabs? There are angry people in your ears. People of God recognize it. 
Know that whatever that's, whatever's in the heart is going to be projected out of the mouth. I always do a self inventory before speaking. Believe it or not, it's more difficult for me to do something like this on Facebook Live than to be in front of people. I, I, I don't, don't ask me why. But one of the things that I realized is that right before I actually went on Facebook Live, I did a self reflection. You know, identify with self. Am I okay? Am I happy? Am I um, able to give a word and, and not put dirty water in the clean water? Am I able to give the truth and not just a truth? Am I able to give a full perspective where the panoramic view of that truth is received by all? Or am I just focused on a certain group? Am I being selfish in my approach or am I being loving in my approach? And all these things, you know, before I actually go on or even before I uh, take on the, the, the pulpit, I ask myself these questions. Did I, get, did I get into an argument today that would cause me to speak a certain way? Did I take something personal earlier that would cause me to act a certain way when I preach or teach the word? These are things that we need to do. Because again, so many people depend on the truth that we give in love, not the truth that we give in, in anger or the truth that we give in hate. And I know hate is a really bad word, but I'm going to say this. If we truly are ministers of reconciliation, then our job is to always be reconciling. Always be reconciling. We need to always look to reconcile not just those around us, not just those in front of us, not just those we counsel, but also reconcile ourselves with someone else or reconcile ourselves with ourselves. It is truly the area of being mature in Christ Jesus, being, and praise God, somebody just put that up, amen. God bless you. God bless you. I don't want to mention anybody's name because then I got to mention everyone's names. Uh, but I, I, I did see that the moment I said that somebody put that up. And praise God that spiritual maturity is required. We got to move into levels of, of growth that will allow people to see that what our desire is, is not an, an agenda, a hidden agenda, but rather an assignment from God. Nathan moved an assignment. Joab moved an agenda. Joab's agenda was to destroy. Joab's agenda was, he, you know, here's, here's the best part that I want to share with you about Joab. Joab did not want to be the leader, but Joab wanted to be able to control the leader. Joab didn't want to be in charge. Joab just wanted to make sure that he was a part of the whole thing. He wanted to be the one on top of or right below the leader. But then notice something. His mouth was not to be in the ears of David. He was not to speak to David the way he did. How foul is that? You know, I believe that with everything that was mentioned tonight, it's going to be important as we move forward and grow in Christ Jesus that we start to realize that there are certain people that are assigned to our ears. Don't listen to those who are not feeling what you're feeling. In other words, don't listen to those who don't care about you. Listen to those who are assigned to you. And, and even if they care about you, they still need to be assigned to you. Because they may give you a word before time. They may give you something that you're not supposed to receive right now. Sometimes the heart will lie to you. Sometimes your heart will tell you to do things that you should not do. And ultimately, we take on what God has given us and we embrace those by his love. Our love is still being worked on. We still got to get worked on in our love. But his love is perfect love. And his perfect love casts out all fear. So today, I want to make sure that the message of the Joabs and the Nathans of the world, that message would be heard. That all the Joabs who may be listening right now know that you are unauthorized to keep speaking into the ears of those who are trying to get right. And don't wound a wounded heart. Joab, do not wound a wounded heart. See, David's heart was wounded. Why would you wound it further? You should have been focused on trying to lift him up and, and encourage him. Joabs of the world, I tell you, stop wounding wounded hearts. Nathans of the world, continue to speak. 
what God has given you. God will always restore if you notice the buildup. Now watch this. David lost a son when he died at birth, right? When he died after giving after, after Bathsheba gave birth. And then he lost an older son, Absalom. If you notice the recovery time on both, when, it, when the word is given by a man of God, authorized, the recovery is faster. Nathan told him, your son will die. He cried, he prayed, he fasted, but once he was told, your son is dead, he didn't keep on mourning. He came out of that, he washed his face, put lotion on his body, and he moved forward. But if you notice the, the message given by Joab, you know, the death of his older son Absalom, even though Absalom did something against him, he was crying and wailing, and that lasted for years. David never really got over the whole death of Absalom. I think that one really struck him badly. Um, even more so than his other son who was killed by Absalom, even more so than his daughter who was raped. I think that that death really did him damage, hence the reason why he wanted to do the right thing when it came to Solomon. Solomon, or Jedediah, um, the name given by God, Jedediah, to Solomon. Um, it's interesting that that name was shifted because David was looking for peace. Solomon has a, is a derivative, or shalom is derived from Solomon. Solomon means peace. And David needed peace in his life. So he calls his son, instead of calling him Jedediah, he calls him Solomon. And because of all the turbulence he went through with all of his children before, he said, let me change this up. And he decided to make it peaceful. So for 40 years... David brought peace to the land of Israel, and of course, Solomon, the next 40 years, did the same thing. Next week, we're going to talk about every single, we're going to start next week, it's going to be a, a seven-week series, and we're going to talk about all the kings of Israel, all 40 of them, with the exception of one who was a queen, so 39 kings and one queen. And we're going to talk about them, and, and this series is going to allow us to see ourselves in the kings. The, the ones that were bad and the ones that were good. There were some that started good and ended up bad, and there were some that started bad and ended off good. We're going to talk about all of them. And the, believe it or not, the bad ones are necessary to talk about, because then we know what not to do. Praise God. I thank God for this time. I believe that. Um, one of the things that we will do in the future, we will start trying to uh, uh, incorporate it in Spanish as well. I know Thursdays, I got a lot of people that I know came on that only speak Spanish, and I apologize to them. I will be uh, attempting to, in the future, making sure that I actually uh, get to the Spanish group as well. But nonetheless, I bless you all. I thank you. Um, if, uh, Oh, there was something else that I did want to mention. Um, those of you who know that I've just written a book, I ask that uh, you uh, still keep spreading that. I just got called by someone who was blessed by the book. Um, the book doesn't have so much, because I know there's a lot of theological uh, points that people wanted to touch on in the, that's within the book. But I will tell you that the book is more of an eye-opener than anything else. I look forward to writing other books that are going to be connected to that particular book. And in those, book, I may, those books, I may go a little deeper. But for now, if, for those of you who are interested, the book um, is called Contaminated Rooms in a Sanctified House. And you can obtain it um, on, online on, uh, um, what's it called? Amazon, Amazon.com. Um, so anybody interested, please. By I really and, and more so than anything else, I want to make sure that people get the message that there is something inside that needs to be fixed. There are things that we need to work on, and um, if we get to that place of working on those areas, we'll find that our lives, everything around us, is at peace. The kingdom of God is about peace. The kingdom of God is about bringing in His peace, and His peace. That's a peace that surpasses all human standard human understanding our standard of peace may be something different we may think peace is just laying down and looking at the stars peace goes beyond that 
Peace goes beyond being at a beach or being uh, uh, by the shore. It goes beyond that. And so I know that in these next seven weeks of this series that I'm going to be giving on First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, we're going to explore those areas of what it means to move in peace or what causes lack of peace. With that said, God bless you all. Love you very much. And till the next time, I know that uh, it seems like every single time this happens is based on a storm. Uh, the one I did in January was based on a storm. The one I'm doing, uh, the one I, do, I did today is based on a storm. So I'm hoping that it's not going to always be based on a storm. But for those of you who are a part of the Flow Kingdom Ministries, I'll see you Saturday at the house. Amen. Those of you who tune in, keep tuning in. We love you. We thank you. Those of you who, um, who continue to bless the ministry, keep blessing the ministry. You don't need to be there to bless us. We are blessed by your prayers. We're blessed by, by you being online like the way you're doing right now. And we're blessed by you honoring us in any way you can. We are right now in a place of transition. And all the help we can get, we receive it. And again, we thank you. We love you. And in Jesus' name, let's pray you out. Father, we thank you for what you've given us today. We know, my God, that this word was to speak to waters clean. I'm talking about all those churches out there where men of God and women of God are dedicating themselves to serving you in spirit and in truth. Lord, let those people who are being confused and being misled, let them be led to a place where the water is clean. Father, also to those who are the Nathans, my God, I ask that you would use them to continue to give a word, to continue to bless and edify the men and women of God. Lord, that they may be able to be a voice to their ears, and those ears will be receptive to their voices. We thank you, my God. Let there be protection, provision, prosperity, peace, and perpetual physical health upon each person who has tuned in today, whether they came on and stayed on, or came on and then turned off later, Lord doesn't make a difference, let the connection be a part of the exchange, bless them abundantly Father, let them feel the anointing that comes with understanding your word, speaking your word, giving your word in spirit and in truth, we love you and we thank you my God, and we thank you for this moment, and in Jesus name we pray, and the people of God say, can't hear you, write it down so I can see it, and the people of God say, amen. Love you all.